everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in tonight for this lung cancer awareness panel discussion. So I'm joined by a few members of our fellows forum. We ha have Dr. Sam Kara, who is a hematology oncology fellow at the University of Miami. Uh, we have Dr. Wakas Huck, who is a third year internal medicine resident at New York University. And we have Dr. Matt Hadfield, who is a hematology oncology fellow at Brown University. So we'll be talking today about some recent research in lung cancer diagnosis and screenings um, and, and some disparities, as well as ways to raise awareness for both patients, the public, and the healthcare community. So really looking forward to having this conversation today. And with that, Dr. Kara, I will turn the conversation over to you. Thanks so much, Kira. Thanks all for tuning in. Um, it's a humbling day. Uh, it's the start of Lung Cancer Awareness Month. Uh, we have a, a love-hate relationship with this disease. We love to take care of the patients who are afflicted by it, and we hate the disease and try to get rid of it. Um, so I'm really honored that we're able to kick off this month. One of the topics that I was hoping to kind of bring to the panel and the public's attention, and we've discussed it in previous episodes, is really the changing face of lung cancer. I'll never forget my first encounter with a lung cancer patient. I was a second year med student in 2015. It was a young Latina down here in South Florida without any smoking history. In fact, she had never even touched a cigarette in her life and she had stage four lung cancer. And I was just shocked at how someone who had never touched a cigarette could be uh, diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. You know, I had entered medical school with a lot of preconceived notions. There's a lot of stigma both in society and with even within the profession. And that's just something that's always been of interest to me to see how the face of lung cancer is rapidly changing. What does the rest of the panel have to think about this or maybe share their experiences with the changing face of lung cancer? Yeah, I think, you know, from my perspective training, you know, in the last couple of years, it's been pretty remarkable to hear, <clears throat> excuse me, stories from attendings that have trained in the early 2000s into the, you know, the last five, seven years and just how rapid the, the field of lung cancer has evolved. I mean, uh, targeted therapies first with EGFR and now ROS and, and, and MET inhibitors, um, KRAS being uh, a druggable target now, um, and, and the treatment of non-driver uh, mutated non-small cell lung cancer, um, you know, the addition of immunotherapy to, to chemotherapy and just how much that's impact overall survival for that patient population. Um, you know, like you said, it's a disease that we, we like to take care of the patients, but it's, it's, it's a horrible disease, but we've made such uh, huge strides and it's been pretty remarkable to, to see how it's evolved. No, thanks for taking this nice, Dr. Hatfield. Uh, you know, to me, what's kind of interesting with sort of the shifting uh, sort of demographics of lung cancer incidence is really sort of the change based on the age. Um, you know, now we're sort of seeing females age 30, 49 in the United States outpace the number of males um, in the same age range that are kind of being diagnosed uh, with cancer, even though the decline in smoking um, has, has sort of, you know, has sort of been a pattern both for males and females. Um, although, interestingly, um, at least from the data we have, the, the peak and decline in smoking in males actually occurred around the year 1965, about one and a half or two decades before women um, in 1985. And just thinking about this sort of from a global trend, uh, what's interesting is that um, even though there's a decline in the percentage of smokers in the world by 10%, just due to urbanization, industrialization, and population growth, there's actually more smokers in 2020 than there were in 1990. So still sort of really a lot of basic primary and primordial prevention that we need to really uh, work on. I think those are both really great points. Um, to build on Dr. Hawks a little bit, um, it's really fascinating the numbers in terms of epidemiology that we're seeing uh, with the changing face. I think literally just yesterday, The Lancet released a large global report outlining the incidence and prevalence of lung cancer by histology. And like he alluded to, what we're seeing is adenocarcinoma, which is traditionally less affiliated, but not exclusively unaffiliated with uh, tobacco exposure, is being seen more commonly in young patients and women over men. Um, I don't think that smoking trends can only explain this. I think that's kind of maybe has a little bit of stigma associated with it as well. We've got to understand what's going on better. And this is one of the research aims I've shared with this forum before. I think you raise a great point too. Um, I, I was just thinking of a patient that I took care of as a first year fellow who uh, was a 43 year old school teacher who developed metastatic lung cancer with, he, he developed back pain and had uh, to have surgery and was found to have EGFR mutated non-small cell lung cancer. And um, one thing that uh, didn't really dawn on me until I began my training uh, in oncology fellowship was the, the stigma that you allude to. Um, he, he would constantly come to see uh, me for appointments and talk about how people would say like, oh, I didn't know you smoked or, uh, you know, it's, it's too bad. Maybe you shouldn't have smoked. And he never smoked in his entire life. Um, and, and it was something that he really carried with him that uh, people would feel this way. And it's an important part of taking care of this population. That I don't think we appreciate enough. Yeah, you know, I I'm still you know you know still a resident, and I have a VA primary care clinic. I have the privilege of you know treating the veteran population, you know, which is sort of 50, 60, 70 year old male population. And 
lot of them, of course, when got into smoking at a time when there was sort of less uh, public health awareness and really sort of data about um, how bad smoking is for you. So it, I think there can be different challenges with talking about screening and talking about uh, you know, quitting smoking sort of based on based on the kind of the, the patient corridor that you have. Absolutely. Both great points as well. Um, to build actually and, and switch the gears a little bit, uh, let's talk about lung cancer screening. Um, I actually just saw a tweet about 15 minutes ago from the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy uh, reminding the public that November 11th is National Lung Cancer Screening Day. And here in the U.S., we do have a um, uh, both funded and encouraged program in lung cancer screening, though we've seen uptake very slowly in the majority of the country, unfortunately. Um, how have uh, both of you kind of integrated lung cancer screening into your personal practice? And what changes would you like to see with the guidelines, perhaps? Yeah, one thing that I could I could speak to um, here is that in, in Rhode Island, we, we have an enormous uh, deficit in the amount of patients that are eligible for screening for lung cancer actually getting the testing done. So one of the attendings here, Hina Khan, uh, got a, a grant from BMS to uh, work on access to clinical, or, um, well, subsequently clinical trial, but um, uh, screening for uh, lung cancer through different initiatives and outreach programs. And we, we've actually seen an uptick, uh, almost 80% uh, more patients now getting a lung cancer screening as uh, before. And, and, and what we've really seen or demonstrated is that outreach to primary care clinics and having a, a dedicated coordinators to try and get these tests uh, on, on people's radars as well as scheduled really made a huge difference. Um, but, you know, I, I think on a whole, uh, being more on the uh, treatment of lung cancer side of things, um, we see people that end up, you know, detecting lung cancer, but I still think that, you know, we have leaps and bounds more to, to get more and more people screened. And it's, it's something that we all have to work on. Yeah, I was actually walking by just the other day in Manhattan, and I saw sort of a poster of uh, just like a person going through a CAT scanner, and uh, they're getting screened for lung cancer, and a uh, sort of interesting ad, because it doesn't really talk about the caveats of lung cancer screening, or sort of about the in inclusion exclusion criteria for different patients. I think what's important from a primary, you know, primary care perspective is really just finding the sort of appropriate patient to screen, right? Um, if you have a patient that's, you know, sort of not taking their hypertension medications, if they're missing follow-ups, that's very different um, than a patient who is who's sort of going to all their appointments um, and you know who's going to be sort of reliable screen for, you know, getting their annual um, low-dose CAT scan. So I think what's really sort of been effective for me is sort of a shared decision-making approach where we can talk sort of about the costs and risk and benefits of, of lung cancer screening. Um, and, so, and, you know, and one of the great things we have about the VA sort of the integrated care is that um, I don't always have to have this conversation. Usually I can just put an order and then the patient will actually have a dedicated appointment where they'll get a call from a counselor who can actually talk more about sort of the merits of lung cancer screening, and then they can kind of go from there. So it's so a little bit different in the VA system. Absolutely. Um, both with kind of nice real world anecdotes there. I think that the screening piece and the identification piece are super important, right? Because in a busy primary care clinic, there's a lot of problems to go through in very limited time. I think that problem is well known, although less well addressed. Um, but even looking one step forward, right, looking at folks who are possibly eligible for lung cancer screening, at least according to current CMS criteria, I'm not sure we're going far enough. Um, we've shown in some previous research at my uh, previous institution that folks, especially of racial um, and sex minorities, are not necessarily always included. Um, that being said, it needs to be balanced, right? Because if you've got a big uh, convoluted model through which you have to put a bunch of variables and see if your patient does or does not qualify, that adds time, um, that takes away from shared decision-making as you alluded to, and it's tough. Um, I know the field is working towards being more inclusive. Um, it's just taking its time, unfortunately. All right, um, and I guess uh, one last sort of topic I was hoping to address with the panel today was kind of looking at biomarker testing um, and how we're doing here, um, both, I guess, nationally and globally. Um, do either of you have thoughts on that? Yeah, um, you know, uh, we were, uh, Dr. Karaf and I were speaking offline before the, the talk uh, started the panel and, and you know, there's an enormous uh, deficit in the amount of biomarker testing that's happening globally right now, particularly in the United States outside of large academic medical centers. I know at, at our center, we have in-house reflex paneling. So anyone who has uh, a histological diagnosis of non-small cell lung cancer um, automatically gets a, a actionable mutation panel, including, you know, KRAS, um, EGFR, MET, et cetera. And it, it really is remarkably important. I mean, if you, if you think about these patients that can be put on targeted therapies, I mean, 20% of patients have EGFR mutations. And if, if you think the amount of patients that aren't getting that testing done throughout the country, um, it's a really, really important thing. And I think that's something that we, uh, we, we all need to, um, we all need to uh, keep in mind and, and, um, and we all need to, to try and, you know, 
raise awareness about because it does make a huge difference for patients. Yeah, it's really following along with Dr. Hatfield said. You know, I think there's a lot of work that we still have to do. I think one of the sort of encouraging points is that over the recent years, we have seen an increased global presence of of cancer and just trying to really find patients from other countries, um, trying to sort of increase sort of this trend into sort of you know precision medicine. And the second thing I think just really is the role of artificial intelligence and machine learning to help use uh, sort of natural language processing and other kinds of methods to automatically identify patients in the chart uh, who might be eligible for for cancer patients, especially patients who are from underrepresented uh, demographics. So I think a lot of work that we can make, but I think I think the future is bright. I'd love to hear the idea of applying AI into that space. Um, certainly would be helpful, especially if there's uh, issues in access either to just cancer treatment generally or um, specific areas uh, wherever that patient might be. You know, I think um, another point that we kind of have to address even at our fellowship level as we kind of enter into the market of healthcare is payer um, reimbursement for biomarker testing. Um, a lot of um, insurance policies or even lack thereof uh, don't necessarily uh, allow uh, for comprehensive biomarker testing. Um, I know my state specifically, our advocacy organization, FLASCO, in conjunction with the American Cancer Society's Cancer Action Network, is appealing to make sure that all health plans, such as Medicaid and that sort of thing, are um, embracing this uh, appropriately to make sure that folks have all the uh, trial access open to them. If we translate that point on the global scale, like we were also mentioning as well, um, that becomes even more complicated because then we're getting into single payer models, um, limited resources, and that sort of thing. But at the end of the day, as physicians, I think it's our duty and our, our, our moral obligation to advocate for our patients and make sure we can uh, get that reimbursed or paid for in whatever way possible because it's the best thing for them. Absolutely. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think just kind of adding on to that, I think the example of colon cancer is really is really cool because we saw Colacard and different kinds of non-invasive tests for colon cancer that sort of were very expensive, cost over $1,000. And then now there are sort of increasing patient eligibility uh, rules and under Medicare and, and other groups uh, to cover it. So, so hopefully we can transfer the same thing uh, to lung cancer. Absolutely. Um, I know our time is running slightly short. Um, I was wondering if the, any of the panelists had any other points they were hoping to make today. No, I think these were some, some remarkable good uh, uh, discussion points. And I think, you know, reiterating that biomarker testing is important in non-small cell lung cancer. And, and, and just to, to say again that uh, this patient population um, deserves the best care, regardless of if they smoke or not. And, you know, there is a, a large stigma around funding uh, cancer research for lung cancer patients. And, and, and we have to work really hard to, to break that stigma. Yeah, and just to add on to Dr. Kerr's points from the beginning, you know, there's a sort of a stigma that smoking equals lung cancer, but there are sort of a lot of other variables that we still need to sort of identify in literature and, and real world data. Uh, you know, COPD, for example, is an independent risk cancer for lung cancer, sort of separate separate from smoking. And um, there's actually a lot of work in radiomics where we're looking at adiposity and other measures of, of body size to actually not just predict uh, sort of response to immunotherapy for lung cancer, but also predict the mortality uh, for lung cancer as well. So if we can really hone in on this data, might able to be able to define sort of screening, you know, parameters for patients who don't fall into that sort of conventional, you know, quit 15 years ago, smoked this many pack years and are about 55 years old. So I think the, I think the future is bright. Absolutely. I guess as I reflect on our discussion today, I kind of have two take home points, one for the public, which is just to remind everyone that anyone with lungs can get lung cancer that could include tobacco exposure that could not include tobacco exposure, etc. But that is the point here. And that's what we're trying to raise awareness of today. For the um, physicians and other providers who are listening today, I think what we've heard is uh, we are moving the needle and we have a lot more way to go. So if you can contribute in any way, whether that's through your community, through your research, through both, um, go ahead and do it. Now's the time. Well, um, I guess that's uh, it for our panel today. Um, thank you all for uh, listening. Uh, happy Lung Cancer Awareness Month. I uh, hope you're able to improve the life of a patient with cancer or lung cancer uh, this month, at least. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for uh, participating in this discussion today. I'm glad we are able to raise awareness of these topics, and it's great to hear about all the research directions that are being taken to address these disparities. So thank you again to everybody for tuning into the discussion today, and stay tuned throughout the month of November. We'll be posting some more Lung Cancer Awareness Month content. So thank you again, and have a great night.